So as we prepare for our scripture reading, Mom is going to tell us the story of Esther in just a few minutes, so I'm going to invite her to come forward, although she's looking at me like she's surprised. (laughs) And um, today, since we're going to hear all of Esther's story, I am going to read just from chapter 4, simply verses 9 through 14. And it says, Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. And then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. And when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you were in the king's house, you alone of the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And now our gospel reading is from Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And this is the word of God. Before I start, I have to say, Tanya has often said that this is the best seat in the house. (laughs) And she's right, because you get to see everybody. Uh, The story of Esther. My name is Esther and means hidden. My Jewish identity was hidden from the king. I lived in ancient Persia about 100 years after the Babylonian captivity. When my parents died, I was orphaned then was adopted and raised by my older cousin, Mordecai. One day, the king of the Persian Empire, Xerxes I, threw a lavish party. On the final day of the festivities, he called for his queen, Vashti, eager to flaunt her beauty to his guest. But the queen refused to appear before Xerxes. Filled with anger, he deposed Queen Vastai and forever removed her from his presence. To find his new queen, Xerxes hosted a royal beauty pageant, and I was chosen for the throne. My cousin Mordecai became a minor official in the Persian government of Susa. I honored him by following his advice and guidance. It was to be a year of training and preparation. I always stayed in touch with Mordecai. Soon Mordecai uncovered a plot to assassinate the king. He told me about the conspiracy, and I, of course, reported it to Xertes, giving credit to Mordecai. The plot was thwarted, and Mordecai's act of kindness was preserved in the Chronicles of the King. At this time, the king's highest official was a wicked man named Haman. He hated the Jews, especially Mordecai, who had refused to bow down to him. I had not yet revealed my race before or after I became queen. Haman devised a scheme to have every Jew in Persia killed. 
The plan was agreed to, and the Jewish people were going to be annihilated on a specific day. Meanwhile, Mordecai learned of the plot and shared it with me, challenging me these famous words. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And uh, that was taken directly from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 13 through 14 of the NIV version. I prayed as I wanted to operate within God's will in this situation. I wanted to use every gift the Lord has given me. I wanted to do what was right, but we must do it wisely using our God-given talents. Then I said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as I had ordered him. Only when I was sure that God's help had been sought earnestly did I risk approaching the king. Then, risking my own life, I approached the king with a request. I was breaking the law when I went into the throne room. As soon as the king saw me standing in the court, I won his favor, and he held out to me the golden scepter that was in his hand. I asked him if he and Haman would come to a banquet I was meant to hold. He agreed. Haman suspected nothing, believing he was being honored by my invitation. He and the king attended the banquet, and I was promised that I could have anything I wanted, even half his kingdom. I asked that the king and Haman attend a second banquet the next day. The king agreed. In high spirits, Haman returned to his home and ordered gallows to be built to hang the enemy he hated, Mordecai. But during the night, the king could not sleep. He told his servants to read from the records of his reign. As they read, he was reminded of the good deed of Mordecai. He realized he had never rewarded him and decided to remedy this. As it happened, Haman was there, and the king asked him how he could reward someone who had been a remarkable servant. This foolish man, Haman, thinking the king was referring to himself, recommended extravagant rewards. The king agreed, but then astonished Haman by telling him that it was Mordecai he wanted to reward. Haman was mortified by his mistake and hated Mordecai even more. Haman's wife warned him, but he was now so eaten up by hatred that he could not turn from the path he was following. Meanwhile, my banquet had been prepared. The king was so pleased by it that he again promised me anything I wanted. I responded by the king's promise, to the king's promise with much more significant request. I asked that my life be spared and my people saved. From whom, asked the king. From Haman, I replied. When the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman had thrown himself on the couch where I was reclining, and the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? Haman was trapped. He was taken out by the king's servants and hanged from the gallows he had built for Mordecai. He did not repent of his hatred for the Jewish population. 
He begged for his life, but gave no indication that he had experienced any change of heart. I had saved Mordecai from Haman, but the Jewish pop population was still in danger. I had gained favor with the king and pleaded with the king. The king held out the golden scepter to me, and I rose and stood before the king. I said, if it pleases the king, and if I have won his favor, and the thing seems right before the king, and I have his approval, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, which he wrote giving orders to, to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming on my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Letters written by myself and Mordecai were again sent to every corner of the empire halting the order of the execution on the Jewish population. The Jews were also permitted to attack those people who had been their enemies and could claim their property. On the very day that they were to have been annihilated, they returned the tables by destroying all those who had sought to kill them. Thousands were killed, including the ten sons of Haman. Mordecai was promoted to Haman's high position, and Jews were granted protection throughout the land. The people celebrated God's tremendous deliverance, and the joyous festival of Purim was instituted. From that day on, the, Jude the Jewish people would keep the day as a special festival called Purim. It was a day when gifts were exchanged among members of each family and presents given to the poor. And the sources for this was uh, learnreligions.com, a book of Esther, and also women in the Bible, uh, by the Women Bible, Old New Testament. So thank you. Thank you. So giving credit where credit's due, Catherine Redden wrote a, a story of Esther, which I have shortened for our service here at Salem. Bethany will have an expanded version of the story of Esther today. All of that happens in a few short chapters in a book in the Bible. So as you can imagine, there are several good movies out there that will engage you into the whole story. Uh, but for now, you know, we've heard Esther's story, a story summarized by the words you know, for such a time as this. Um, so we're really just going to mention briefly about Esther, and then we're going to talk a little about how we see this in everyday life, in our lives. So, you know, when the, Esther became queen, the king didn't know she was Jewish, and she could have kept the secret. You know, there was a plot out against the Jewish people, and Mordecai told her, just because you're part of the royal household, don't presume you're safe. And he goes on to remind her, you may have come to this position for such a time as this. So before there was action, there was prayer and there was fasting. And then Esther says she'll go before the king. And you didn't just go before the king, even if you were married to him. So it was a courageous act all on its own. But she says, I'll go and if I perish, I perish. She was there in a certain time, in a certain place, in a situation, and we hear the words, you may be here for such a time as this. And we think about the people throughout the Bible and throughout history that those words can apply to. You know, we've talked about three of them in the past several weeks um, with Abraham and Joseph and Moses. Like all could very well be said, they were put there for a time and a place. Purposes and needs were lived out in them. And we've seen this throughout our history and throughout our lifetime. Um, watching the movie Harriet last night, which was amazing if you haven't seen it, you know, I was reminded, you know, that during her daring escape from freedom, that really her story was just beginning. You know, once she was safe, she repeatedly went back to make sure others were safe. 
um, that she lived uh, for such a time as this moment over and over again. We've heard words from famous people like Martin Luther King Jr. that we could believe were put for a certain time and a certain place. If you aren't familiar with the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it is wonderful reading, powerful reading, coming out of being a resistance to Hitler. You know, a person put at a time and a place for work that is called by God. People called to be voices and leaders, um, people to help get things started or keep things going or to bring about change. Um, Esther to protect the Jewish people, Harriet Tubman to free people from slavery, Martin Luther King Jr. to speak for change, and Bonhoeffer to be a prophetic voice against hate and against Hitler when even the church was going along and we know the atrocities that followed. And more than all of that, I will just want to briefly mention um, some of the ways that we might be called during our lifetime for such a time as this opportunities, because I believe we all are at various moments, given the chance to stand for someone else in some way. And really, I had a lot of possibilities laid out, but I don't think I need to lay them out to you. Um, You turn on the TV, you look around you in nearby schools, in faraway places, all the things that we could be called for for such a time as this. A time that speaks love instead of hate. A time that builds people up instead of tearing people down. Um, And it all really boils down to what does God break our heart for? Um, He makes things important to each and every one of us. He shares his heart with us. And the more I believe we diligently seek to hear his voice, you know, those nudgings come to be a voice for someone else. Um, So that maybe, you know, these words from Esther that stir me up every time I read them, that maybe you're here for such a time as this. Maybe it sparks in our prayer time a time for, you know, God, what are you calling me for? How do I look outside of myself and see what is around me and to see the work that you may be calling me to? Um, Jesus was asked, what was the greatest commandment? And he answered, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul, and then to go and love your neighbor. When we consider these things, we choose to go and love our neighbor. I'm going to share two last things with you. There was a line in the movie last night when Harriet decided she was going to run. Um, Her father sends her to the church. He said, go knock on the church's door and talk to the reverend. And, she, and he said, and then you've got to get going. You've got to be far away from here by daylight. And um, when she goes and she talks to him, the pastor tells her, you know, fear is your enemy. You know, it says that the Bible says it 365 times. I haven't gone through and counted them. Do not be afraid. But I can tell you it says it a lot. So it tells us the importance of not letting fear stop us and what we, fear, what we feel that God is calling us to. You know, almost as soon as they said that line last night, I thought, you know, what else is our enemy is complacency. You know, when we're comfortable, it's easier not to see all the things around us. So I'm going to end today um, with a famous poem, part of which is found on the walls of the Holocaust Museum in D.C., written by Martin Niemöller. And it says, first they came for the communist, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. Um, May we be faithful to be reminded of those around us in the moments that they may need us to speak for them. May it be so. Amen.